As always, I'm thankful to, for this privilege to be standing before you on this beautiful Lord's Day. If you would like to follow along, our text will come from the 12th chapter of John this morning. Now, if you consider the first century and the, the time that our Lord was doing his work, by and large, the folks that he came into contact with, in spite of the myriad of undeniable proof that was publicly offered to them, rejected our Savior. John chapter 12, verse 37 says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. We find throughout the New Testament, particularly Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, Mark chapter 3, verse 22, and Luke chapter 11, verse 15, that they accused him of being demon-possessed. And he fought those arguments accordingly. But then we find that there were some who indeed did believe on him. Of that group, there were those that believed but were fear fearful. We find mention of them in John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43 which will serve as this morning's text. Verse 42 reads, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also believed many on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So this morning I'd like for us to discuss four lessons from this phrase, those among the chief rulers. First, this come, will come as no surprise to anyone here, but our first point we'd like to point out is the failure of the faith-only doctrine. The verses that we just read underscore the principles located in James chapter 2, verses 24 and 26. James there pens, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Our text, John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, shows that many believed. Yet in verse 42 says they would not confess him. Confession is required on the part of the believer. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33 which reads, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Verse 33, But whoso shall ever, whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Confession of Christ before others precedes salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If it is the case that the faith-only doctrine is true, that these that would not confess Christ are saved. Now we know from Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 that a saving faith is the faith that worketh by love. There are works of obedience required. James chapter 2 verses 18 through 26. Confession of Christ is a work. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Repentance and baptism are also works. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. We see throughout the Old Testament that Noah had to build an ark. Genesis chapter 6 verse 22. If he did not build an ark, he would have been just as lost as the world full of sin around him. He would have been guilty of believing in God, believing that he was able to destroy the world with water, but still fall short by not acting. Abraham had to act regarding Isaac. He was commanded to sacrifice his only, only son, and he attempted to do so. James chapter 2, verses 21 and 23, and you can find that entire account in Genesis chapter 22. Now, if faith only saves, we're going to have a lot of demons in heaven. James chapter 2, verse 19. The demons believe 
and tremble. I dare say that these demons have stronger faith in God than many today. Unfortunately, many even in the church. But nonetheless, they'll be lost because they do not obey God. Secondly, we would like to consider the absurdity of fearing man, fearing men. We see in verse 42 of John 12 that these rulers feared men rather than God. It says, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Well, they liked those seats in the synagogue. If they confess Christ in front of those who hate him, naturally they might suffer consequences, and they fear those consequences rather than God. This fear of men crippled their resolve to confess Christ before others. They feared angering the Pharisees. They feared what they might do to them. They also feared what those Pharisees might even think about them. Will we today allow the opinions and actions of others deter us and even determine the, the strength and level of our faith? We're told by Jesus in Matthew 10 verse 28 not to fear those that can kill the body but to fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. I was told for a while when I was up at Fish Hatchery there worshiping with those brethren, they can kill you, but they can't eat you. Well, if they kill me, I'm not going to worry about whether or not they eat me because I'm already dead. My spirit is the part of that body. You know, just because somebody doesn't like me does not mean I have good reason not to obey God. Those that were among these chief rulers didn't understand that. They wanted the praise of men. They wanted to fear those men rather than fearing God. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Kind of relays what we just said about killing me, eating me after I'm dead. If they kill you, that's it. That's the extent of their power. Now we know from Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, chapter 25, verse 41 and 46, as well as Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 46, and verse 48, that hell is an unquenchable fire. You see this term mainly being used in metallurgy today. When someone will shape a piece of molten metal, whether it's iron or stainless steel, there's a lot of Damascus still being used for blades. But you get it super hot, you can shape it, and then you quench it in either water or some type of, of petroleum product. And the idea there is to rapidly cool that metal. Hell is not that way. There is no thing in existence that is going to put out that fire. That should make these chief rulers fear. It should also serve to give us appropriate amount of fear today. Because hell, hell is not going to end if we are indeed lost. And we can know whether we're lost or not. Now when I was in my middle teens, you know, I, was, I, was, I was playing football in high school. And there was one summer that I had just gotten onto the varsity team. And we had a scrimmage on a Saturday. It's not uncommon. It also happened that Ward Street Church of Christ up in Marlin had a lectureship. I wanted to go to that lectureship. Well, I got into a verbal argument with my father over whether or not I was going to be at that lectureship. And I was coming home from football practice, and we were sitting in the cab in the driveway of our house. And he says, no, you're not going to that lectureship. 
So I sat there and I quoted Matthew 6, 33 to him. He would yell at me, he'd cuss at me, whatever. Well, ultimately, I had no choice on whether or not I was able to go to that lectureship. I did not have safe transportation. So that Saturday, I had to go to football practice. Football scrimmage, rather. But I certainly wanted to go to that lectureship. That would have been the first one I was able to attend, especially as what I considered myself to be at that time a Christian. Find out later that I was not, excuse me, I was not at that time through my own ignorance. But nonetheless, I fought with him on that. Unfortunately, at the time, I lost. But my resolve was still there. Now, husbands, you are the head of your home. Are you going to allow such things as that to creep into your family? Are you going to allow the world to influence whether or not you're going to be the spiritual leader of your family? As husbands, we are obligated by God himself to take care of our families both physically and spiritually. My father failed on both accounts several times. That's just one example. Are we going to allow ourselves as husbands to do that today? I certainly hope not. Whether that means making sure our families are here at worship. You know, now it's 930. We're here for an hour. Are we going to make sure our family's here? I hope so. This is where all Christians need to be every morning. Worshiping God in spirit and the truth. Wives. I'm not a wife. But God says wives are to guide the home. You can't guide the home if you're not there. I was told by my grandfather and many others that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Who makes strong elders? Who makes strong preachers? It's the mother. It's the God-fearing mother. If she's doing what she's supposed to, as she's discharging her obligations as God has laid out in His Word, it's the mother. Now certainly that gets... Reinforced by the Father, reinforced by the church, but it starts with Mama. She lays that foundation for the kids. Now, ultimately, it's up to them to follow that and build on it themselves, but she lays the groundwork. We know that the life of a faithful wife can eventually convert the husband. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Are we going to fear man, or are we going to fear God? God has given us these obligations, these roles to fill. Are we going to fill them? Because the world is increasingly militant against us doing so. <clears throat> we must fear and obey God. For this is our whole duty. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. As Peter proclaimed, we ought to obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We also must have a godly fear. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Because our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 24. True judgment belong, belongs only to God and not man. Mankind might judge us and you know they might even try to kill us and they might ultimately succeed. But on that last day, it's not what their opinion is. It's what God knows about us that matters. Whom should we actually aim to please? Third, <clears throat> the danger of desiring the praise of men over the praise of God. Now, most people enjoy having a good compliment. They enjoy getting approval from others. It's always kind of made me uncomfortable, but I'm starting to, starting to like it as well. But by and large, folks need reinforcement. We as humans, we're social beings, and oftentimes we just need encouragement. We need that uplifting moment, approval or a compliment or the like. <coughs> Now, I personally, at work, I enjoy receiving a good review. My wife does, too. Because Dad's bringing home the bacon. Well, 
The danger comes from when we seek after that approval and that only. When we seek after that type of praise at any cost. You know, there's just some praise that we need to learn to live without. Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 6, verse 22. It says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You see, the rulers in our text were men pleasers. Now, if we aim to please men, we are not Christ's servants. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Colossians 3, verse 22. As it was Jude, verse 16. We see in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 8 through 13, that Israel of old rebelled against God. <clears throat> it says, Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which to say to the seers, See not, and the prophets prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. That certainly sounds like the state of this world, increasing so every minute. <clears throat> now, we as members of spiritual Israel can fall into the same snare. We can do the same thing as Israel of old. Paul penned to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, why would I want to do that? Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Folks, that time is here. There are several folks, by and large, most of the world, that they don't want to hear the truth. They want those smooth things taught from those around them. They want that encouragement that the sin that they're in is okay. Now the prophets of old to Israel knew better than to teach such lies. Nowadays as Christians, we should know better than to teach such lies. We ought not to do those things. Instead, we ought to be preaching the truth whenever they want to hear it, whenever they, want, whenever they don't want to hear it, in season and out of season. And our fourth point, fourth and final, we want to consider the common failure of the high and powerful. You see, wealthy and powerful people, men and women, very rarely ever serve God. Now, there certainly have been before, but they are the exception and not the rule. We know from the teaching of Jesus that it is more difficult for the rich to enter heaven. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. Mark chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 18, verse 25. As was well 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 10. Which reads, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The key there is they that will be rich. They aren't content with the things that they've got. 
the verses preceding the passage we just read tell us to do to be content with the things we've got. You know, we came into this world with nothing. We're going to leave this world with nothing also. We're going to leave everything behind. Now, certainly it would be nice to leave something for your family. I know I'd like to do that. But I'm not taking that money with me. And if that money is all I'm living for, I have seriously gotten my priorities out of order. Now, being rich is not a sin. <clears throat> However, covetousness is. Colossians 3, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. And 2 Peter 2, verse 3. Money, like many things today, is a tool. How are we going to use that tool? Just like many things today, it's not a sin in and of itself, but it can become one when we allow it to beset us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The idea of beset is when you have multiple people racing and you're running, because I want to win. I don't normally run, but if I did, I want to win. If someone's going to beset me, they're going to start elbowing me, trying to push me, get me off track. That's the idea of besetting. My opponent is trying to thwart my efforts. I actually had that happen one time. We were running in off season, and <clears throat> one of my buddies tripped me on accident. I fell, and it wasn't exactly the most grateful of, graceful of falls. Ended up cutting my knees open, but I got back up and I ran. He thwarted my efforts, or at least attempted to. You know, sin is very similar to that. We must have the attitude of, you might knock me down, but I'm getting back up, and I will complete this race. But money is a tool that so many lust after, so many desire to have in this life, and it's quite easily to beset them. We see that it beset the rich young man in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 and through 22. Now these chief rulers, they were high and they were powerful. Now whether or not they were men or women of great wealth, we probably will never know. But regardless, it is a, a trap that they could have fallen into, just like we can today, and many have before us. We have described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, by Paul, it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. You mean I can't buy my way into heaven? That's the idea of indulgences from Catholic doctrine. And certainly many today would hold that view. If I have enough money, I should pay enough out that you'll just overlook my sins. That's even if they acknowledge that they have sins. But you see, God did not call the mighty, the noble things of this world, to make a big show out of Christianity. It's not how he does things. It's not how he chose to do things with the scheme of redemption. Often some seek to please those with the money or the power so that ultimately they can receive a favor or maybe they can just feel good about themselves. You know, they help the millionaire down the block. Or, you know, you can keep on going with that idea. We saw that this was going on in James chapter 2, particularly verse 3. The brethren there were giving preference to those that were wealthy, were powerful. They gave them the better seats. We ought not be doing that. Now, in the attempt to please them, that is, the rich, the wealthy, the powerful, typically errors are made. Just like with every, when you're trying to please man to any extent, 
typically you're going to find error. Today we see community churches. We see what many call, quote, praise services. These are nothing more than salve for the conscience. We've got folks that more than likely are guilty. At least they, they understand that they are. Their conscience, I hope, is gnawing on them. But they need something to make themselves feel better. Well, these community churches and these praise teams or whatever you want to call them serve exactly that function. If I can feel good about the error that I'm living, I'm going to keep on living in my error. Rather than actually hearing the truth and believing it and properly applying it to get rid of that error. You've got some folks that might even pronounce that they do have faith, but they won't live it out. They fall into the group of the practical atheists. They believe in God. They, they say that they know that He exists, but they don't do His commandments. Many want the privileges of Christianity, but none of the duties. Convenience is king. Particularly with the millennial generation, I, would, I just want a handout. It's, you deserve to get free things. That's their idea. I do anyway. I want free things. But you don't get any. I deserve it because I don't really know who determined that, but somebody did, and that's their mentality. Rather than working for those things, they just want a handout. Well, God is not going to hand out salvation in the sense of you do nothing. You sit on your couch, especially during this pandemic, and just sit there and twiddle your thumbs, maybe watch Netflix, and then lo and behold, you get salvation. No, it takes work. It takes effort on our part. If anything, just studying your Bible. Now, we see... In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, where Jesus pronounces some woes upon the Pharisees. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. This describes the class of people that we've just been talking about for the last few minutes. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, that they make broad their phylacteries, enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Many today have this goal in mind. Jesus condemned that quite plainly. But so many today have fallen into that trap, attempting to praise men rather than God. Now they might think they're getting away with that in this life, but the scriptures teach that they will not. They will be judged accordingly. Now this morning we have considered these four lessons from those among the chief rulers, as we found in John chapter four, or, or excuse me, John chapter twelve, verse forty-two and forty-three. We've noted the failure of the faith-only doctrine. We have considered the absurdity of fearing men rather than God. We have seen the danger of desiring the praise of men over the praise of God. And we have just talked about the common failure of the high and powerful. If you put your stock in men, your stock's always going to drop. Now as Christians, we today must beware lest we fall into the same trap as these outlined in Scripture. Likewise, these chief rulers. Now also, we must be willing and able to meet these various philosophies as we come into contact with those with them. We need to be able to defend the truth of God's word and take it to them to not only show that their philosophy is wrong, but to, to show them the much better philosophy. That is obe being obedient to God and His will. 
<clears throat> we see that this world is becoming more and more militant against God, His followers, and His Word. How are we going to handle that? Now, we've also discussed from the Word of God what it takes to become a child of God. If you would like to become one this morning, please take the next few moments to do so. If you are already his child, yet you have allowed through weakness sin to creep back into your life, through repentance and prayer, James 5, 16 and 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 9, have that sin removed. Be restored in the eyes of your, your creator this morning. Whatever the need may be, please make it known as together we stand and sing. <clears throat> 